This is Paul McGuire, and you are listening to both a prophetic emergency alert on video all around the world, including the USA, and simultaneously you may be listening to the Paul McGuire report that you can hear on audio all around the U.S. and across the world. The Supreme Court defined secular humanism as a uh, um, religion. Secular, secular humanists say that secular humanism is not a religion, it's a science. Wrong. The Supreme Court says secular humanism is a religion like any other religion. It's simply the religion where they don't believe in God. Now, secular humanists not only don't believe in God, they think we're gods. Okay? That's a great thing to teach a child. You want to spoil a child into psychosis? Teach the child that he or she is a god and treat them accordingly. So, a child needs discipline, boundaries, and when you don't allow them to have that, you're cheating them and you're deforming them psychologically. Okay, so... The, the goal for a parent is, of course, the first and most priority thing is to love your child, bond with your child, be friends with your child, play with your child, laugh with your child. That's imperative. And that's number one, by the way. That's the first priority. Discipline is not the first priority. Loving the child is the first priority. And so, once the child knows that you love them passionately, and that you're their friend, and but you're also their loving parent, then they will understand intuitively that when they're disciplined or spanked or whatever, they will know that you're doing it out of love, not out of anger. And by the way, you should never discipline, punish, or spank your child when you're in an anger state of consciousness. Because if you're disciplining or punishing your child when you're angry or in an anger state of consciousness, you're violating God's laws of parenting. Because all you're doing, if you're honest, is you're releasing your anger uh, by spanking your child. You're venting your anger by punishing your child. You're, you're downloading your anger by, by uh, you know, disciplining your child. And the child can tell the difference between when you're disciplining him or her out of love versus disciplining him or her out of anger. Okay? Now, we now live in a new paradigm that, that has been evolving for the last 40 years. There was a famous book that every parent read, and the author, I believe the author, you need to correct me if I'm wrong, it was a, it was, it was a best-selling book on parenting, and it was written by, I believe it was a Dr. Spock. Okay, it's been a long time. And that influenced just about every parent in America, Christian and non-Christian. But what was revolutionary about Dr. Spock's book was that he smashed the foundational structure of parenting and he radically transformed parenting into a liberal activity. And he uh, was against punishment or spanking, and everything was liberal. And, 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 and see, when you start to be your child's buddy, and this is what I was getting at, when you see, often you'll see mothers and daughters walking together in America, sometimes fathers and mothers or whatever, 
And what you'll, you'll notice often is the mother is trying to look like and dress like the daughter. And in the mother's mind, she thinks that's hip and cute and a way of bonding. It's not. It's a, it's a, it's a bad strategy. Because God did not call you, first and foremost, to be your, your daughter's buddy, pal, or best friend. That's not what she wants. God called you to be your daughter. Uh, God called you to be a loving parent to your daughter. Your daughter needs somebody to look up to. She doesn't want an equal. She's got her, her teenage friends. She needs a mother to look up to. She needs a mother who's going to guide her through the forest. And as for the mother dressing like uh, the daughter, the, the, the reason for that is that the psychological reason that the mother wants to dress like the daughter and have her hair done like the daughter and have a body shape like the daughter is this is a subconscious desire of, uh, on, uh, upon the mother who secretly and may not be aware of it, but she desires to recapture, relive, and regain her youth. And the reality is, uh, because of the mother's emotional and spiritual immaturity, she sees herself subconsciously in competition with the daughter. And so, in order to win that competition, she wants to have a body shape like her teenage daughter, she wants to fit into the same tight clothes that teenagers wear, the same hair, and she wants to be like a clone of her daughter. Again, the problem with that is it devalues the mother. She's not aware of it, but people don't respect that. They don't. Because first of all, in terms of her, how old the mother is, the mother is supposed to have a, a wonderful identity of her own, not borrow her daughter's identity. The mother can dress great and hip or whatever her taste is, as long as it's not overtly sexually provocative or whatever. The mother has tremendous freedom to dress the way she wants to and be cool and hip, but to, 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 to do it in her own way. Not like a teenager. Um, the mother can wear her hair any way she wants to. But it shouldn't be a clone of her daughter. She shouldn't be in competition with the daughter. And one of the feedback loops that a mother will often get if she's paying attention to this dynamic is that if she goes somewhere like the mall or whatever, and she's walking with a daughter, and she, she's dressed like the daughter's best teenage friend, if the young guys that the teenage daughter is trying to impress, if young teenage guys are starting to check out the mother physically uh, just as much or more as they were checking out the daughter physically, that means whatever the mother is doing is inappropriate and wrong. The mother in no way should be in a competition with her teenage daughter. What happens is the teenage daughter is hypersensitive to that. The teenage daughter is hyper, hypersensitive to the feedback that the teenage boys and her girlfriends are giving. And the teenage daughter is like got radar and the minute her male friends or teenage boys her age start seriously checking out the mother and you know exactly what I mean the teenage daughter feels threatened because now she doesn't even have a mother and and if she has a teenage friend uh, who's, who's really her mother she now finds herself 
in a very, very, very uncomfortable competition with her mother. It's unnatural. And every one of you know exactly what I'm saying, unless you live in a cave near Osama bin Laden before he died. Okay, you're listening, <laughs> you're listening to the Bull McGuire Report. That topic was not exactly what I intended when I got into it. But whenever I do a presentation, either in the Paul McGuire Prophetic Emergency Alerts or in the um, Paul McGuire Report radio audio program or speaking at a conference or writing a book or whatever, my rule for myself that I attempt to live by is I surrender myself, my mind, my person, I surrender it to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, hopefully in the early part of the day, and I call upon God, and I commit my ways to God, and I, I, I repent and ask to be cleansed with the blood of Jesus, I ask God to sanctify me, I ask God to clothe me with power from on high, which is the Holy Spirit, and to fill me with the Holy Spirit, and, and I bind the principalities and powers, and I ask God throughout the day, because so much of the ministry God has given me is, is a massive media outflow where my words that I'm speaking, the ideas that I'm speaking, the truths that I'm speaking are flowing out to hundreds of thousands and millions of people around the world, like every 30 days or so, okay? That's not an exaggeration if you see the real numbers and not the rigged numbers. Okay, so one of my prayers before I go to sleep and when I wake up is, Lord, and I'll name some stuff, media, and I'll say, Lord, speak through me. Get, let me speak your words, your ideas. Lord, let the Holy Spirit flow through me and uh, communicate your ideas, your truths, uh, uh, your biblical principles. Uh, in other words, Lord, I want to get out of the way. Flow through me. Okay, so God comes first. I'm in the back seat. Okay? So, I ask Him specifically to flow through me with His Spirit, no matter what I'm saying or ministering, and anoint me as I speak on the Internet, uh, various social media platforms, conferences, write books, write articles, minister and preach at Paradise Mountain Church, uh, Bible studies. I mean, my average day, average month and average year is, is I'm constantly moving from one media platform to another. It's not never-ending. And so I know that I have a desperate need for the Lord's constant anointing and that the Lord would constantly move through me to minister to people through His Spirit. And I'm very serious about that because if I get into the mode of it's very easy for any minister, author, speaker, and teacher. It's very easy for any of us, including me, to slip into the wrong mode. And, and when you're in the wrong mode, then you're relying <clears throat> on your own human flesh, your own human strength, your own human ideas, your own human creativity, your own human analysis, your own human everything. And no matter how smart, clever, and educated you are, it's going to fall flat. Because the flesh cannot produce the work of the Spirit. Nobody, whether you're, you're a housewife, a truck driver, a volunteer, uh, an executive, own your own company, a minister, whatever you're doing, nobody... Nobody can do the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ in the flesh, which means in and of their own power. If you attempt it, 
You may fool people for a, a long time. You may fool yourself. But you will never sow the anointed seed and speak the anointed truth that God wants you to. Because when you speak anointed truth and, and your words are anointed seeds, they have the dunamis dynamite power of God and they birth massive spiritual fruit, salvation, deliverances. They change the destiny of people's lives. They, they sow miraculous power in people and they set people free. I don't care how clever you think you are and I don't care how clever I may think I am and, and if I'm yielding to deception none of us can fake it and use our own strength to accomplish the mission of God that can only be accomplished by relying on his spirit not by might says the Lord but my spirit says the Lord and that's access, access by faith now I am in the process of completing, I thought my last book was the most important look, book of my life, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Sorry for bending down. It has this cover here. Am I getting it? Yeah. I thought that was the, the, the most important book that I've ever written. The reality is, it is one of the most important books I've ever written. written. Um, this book explains in, 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 a, in the most high-powered, easy-to-understand manner. It explains for anyone, the average person and the person that thinks he or she is a super genius, and maybe you are, it explains exactly where we are right now in America and the world in history, what, how we got here, and it explains what is coming ne next. It explains in multi-dimensional detail why we're in the greatest struggle in the history of mankind and why that battle and why that greatest struggle in the history of mankind is taking place in the hearts and minds of mankind, see? The, the, the war zone is in the hearts and minds of mankind. And so this book explains going back to ancient Babylon and, and, and the creation of Mystery Babylon. And remember, Mystery Babylon was created in ancient Babylon at the top time of the Tower of Babel. And what ancient Babylon was was the world's first new world order, the world's first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system.
And you, you have to master the spiritual truths and, and understand the occult devices of the enemy. If you don't know what happened in Babylon, you can't possibly understand what's happening now. Because what's happening now in our world is the return of Mystery Babylon right before our eyes and what was called the New World Order, they simply changed the name. The New World Order is synonymous with the global, re the, the, the global reset. Global reset is the New World Order. And in this book I explain to you from the beginning of history to, until now the role that powerful occult secret societies have played in all this, such as the Illuminati, Skull and Bones, the Vril Society, Mystery Babylon, the Rosicrucians, which became the Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Masons, and on and on and on. You need to, un you need to have at least a basic understanding. Look, we're in a war. We're in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. That means we're in the greatest battle for souls. The greatest battle to win people to Jesus Christ in the history of the world. Because we're in the last days. You have to know the basics of spiritual warfare. Let me put it simply. If every Christian totally understood Ephesians chapter 6, if they not only understood, but if they simply mastered the basic truths, and not only that, they owned the basic truths, we could drive satanic powers, principalities and powers, demons, out of our families, people's lives, our nation, globalist institutions. How, why would we drive them out? Because we are tap if we are true biblical Christians, and this book will explain to you how to do it if you don't know how to do it. God wants you to understand how you can tap in right now to a power that is so far superior to any occult, satanic, or luciferian power. So, the book shows you that the tragedy is that since the beginning of time, the children of this world, world system, the Luciferian system, the children of this present Luciferian system, the Bible says, are often far wiser in their generation, that means this generation that we're in, they're often far wiser in their generation, this generation, than the children of God are in this generation. Now how could it possibly be, even though that's a Bible verse, how could it possibly be that God's people are not up to speed when compared with Satan's people? How could that be? That's not God's will. That's not God's will. That's why we're losing America. You know, we are right now in the middle of a full-blown, full-on Marxist revolution in America and many other places of the world. That's not an exaggeration. That's not an embellishment. I explain the history of Marxism, Communism, Socialism, the Illuminati, and Globalism in this book, The Greatest Battle. Because most Christians, because they have no understanding of history, and when you have no understanding of history, you have no intellectual or mental ability to understand what came before you, and what happened before you, and why. In other words, because you have failed, I'm not condemning you, I'm trying to exhort you, because you have failed to acquire knowledge, wisdom, 
education, guidance from God. And let's remember, in Proverbs, in many other places, God is commanding. He's not, he's not saying, you know, you, you, you should consider this. He's the supreme being. So in the Word of God, God is commanding His people, like you and me, to gain knowledge, to gain wisdom, to gain understanding, to pursue all of those things aggressively as if they were precious jewels. We are to gain God's guidance, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. That means that we must first and foremost operate our lives and the church's life on a foundation of knowledge, historical knowledge, and knowledge in science, politics, geopolitics, government, law, science, medicine, and on and on and on. All these so-called non-spiritual areas or categories, and, and, and by the way, the only reason they're perceived as non-spiritual is because evangelical Christians and Bible-believing Bible Christians in the last 200 years arbitrarily decided, without consulting the Bible, without consulting God's Word, they just decided in their own fallen humanness, they embraced a massive theological era. They embraced, yeah, I'm talking about Christians, they embraced a massive theological era. They embraced a, they embraced uh, tragically false doctrines, false prophets, false theology, and a faulty understanding of the Word of God. Therefore, Christians today, young people, older people, middle-aged people, whatever, Christians today are temporarily losing the battle for the hearts and souls of mankind. We're temporarily losing that battle, not because we have inferior power or knowledge, but because we have chosen to disregard what God has told us to do. We should be standing on a firm foundation or the solid rock of Jesus. And remember, Jesus is the Word become flesh. Here is the primary era. I'm going to spell it out to you really easy. The primary era is that modern Christians, evangelicals, born-again Christians, whatever you want to call them, and modern Christian pastors, denominational heads, modern Christian professors, modern Christian ministry heads, and modern Christian you know, authors, etc., etc. They may have a, a great understanding of the Bible in many areas, but this is their Achilles heel because it will collapse the entire structure. And this is the problem. They perceive falsely that the truth that Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me, they perceive uh, falsely that the truth that God's Word is speaking of, that the truth that Jesus Christ is speaking of, they perceive falsely and act falsely upon it. What they see in their distorted vision is this. They believe in their hearts, and this is a lie that they're believing, they believe that the truth that Jesus spoke about, the truth that the Bible speaks about, only is dealing with spiritual truth and spiritual things. 
and things that are specifically and overtly biblical. That is a deep, deep and dangerous spirit, spiritual era. And it's not true. It's a falsehood. You know, God says, rightly divide the Word of God. That means study to show yourself approved. Read the Word of God. Study it. Read books that you trust. If you don't read, you might as well write the words imbecile on the front of your t-shirt and idiot on the back of your t-shirt. Now, if I'm insulting you, it's on purpose. Not because I'm obnoxious and arrogant. I'm using those terminologies for their shock value to wake you up because the hour is late. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yes, the primary, the most important truth is the truth of Jesus Christ and salvation by faith in Christ Jesus, and that by faith we can have our sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that we can be born again by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which will give us eternal life, and, we, and by faith we will be with Jesus and the others that are saved in heaven forever and ever. That is the most important truth. That is nu numero uno. I agree with you. But just because it's the most important truth, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't destroy, obliterate, or remove, or erase all the other very, very important truths that, that in which you and I and our children and grandchildren will not survive, will not be saved, etc., etc., unless we also understand and embrace and practice all the other truths that the Bible talks about and that Jesus Christ talks about. Okay, so what, let's just summarize this. It is true that spiritual truths from Jesus and the Bible, especially the truth of salvation and repentance by faith, is the most important truth. We agree. But it, you are in deep spiritual era you are not rightly dividing the Word of God if you stop there. The Bible and Jesus speak and minister about an enormous number of categories and subjects that constitute truth and for every believer in Jesus Christ it is a matter of life and death that you fully comprehend and understand that first, not only do you understand that all these other categories are truth, but it is your responsible responsibility to own and master all those truths. What am I saying? I'm saying what the Word of God is saying. Truth is not to be absorbed in a compartmentalized manner. That's what Luciferian, occult and satanic truth, uh, that's how that is packaged. It's in a compartmentalized manner. So, for example, on the back of a, a U.S. dollar, on the left-hand side, you see an occult pyramid with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer, the words on the base of the pyramid read Nuvos Order Seclorum, or New Order of the Ages, or New World Order. Say That, that also uh, symbolically represents Satan or Lucifer's organizational flowchart, the pyramid structure. And by the way, that pyramid is a replica of of the Tower of Babel. So it's a Babylonian system. You say, how can you say that? Because ar architecturally, a pyramid architecturally is called a ziggurat. So 
the Tower of Babel technically is a ziggurat. What is a ziggurat? A ziggurat is a pyramidical or pyramid-shaped building structure, like a tower. So when they built the Tower of Babel, it was built in our mindset in the shape of a pyramid, but in their mindset it was built as a ziggurat or a pyramidical structure. So when you see the pyramid on the back of the US dollar, you're looking at a pyramid. Now, in Lucifer's organizational structure, you notice he ranks people from top to bottom because he's a control freak. The pyramid structure organizational system allows him, Satan, to not to give certain information to people on the right hand side and the left hand side, and it, it, it erects arbitrary compartments or barriers so that only certain truths are understood by the people on the right hand side and then other certain truths are um, uh, only understood stood by people on the left hand side so you're able to divide up compartmentalize and separate people and each separation each category each compartment is allowed to know separate and distinct truths Satan doesn't spread out the knowledge of his truths to everybody. Why? Because that would undermine his power, that, that would weaken him in his spiritual war, and logistically, one of the best ways to, to uh, keep for yourself the ancient secrets of mystery Babylon and the secrets of secret societies the best way to do that is through compartmentalized storage of information. Our military corporations use the same thing. On the back of the dollar you're looking at the Tower of Babylon in a pyramid shape. At the top of the unfinished pyramid, and by the way, the rankings of people, the lower level people with the lower power and the lower rankings are on the base of the pyramid. As you go up and the pyramid gets narrower and narrower, you now have compartmentalized information and knowledge that's exclusively given to, to a much smaller percentage of Satan's servants. And it's designed that the higher you go, the more knowledge his servants have, but the fewer people, especially the masses, have access to it. Interestingly enough, the kingdom of God works on different principles because God is love. Satan is about lies, power, self, total control, and ultimately the greatest lust of Satan and the greatest goal of Satan is he wants to be God. So, right now, and it began uh, in, in the Old Testament a long time ago Satan in his lust to be God uh, started a revolution against God and Satan got one third of the fallen angels to join him so one third of the angels became fallen angels when they joined Lucifer in his rebellion against God and their end game is to overthrow the throne room of God and install Satan or Lucifer upon the throne room of God and Lucifer wants the people, he wants total control of the earth and he wants the people of planet earth to worship him as if he was God. That's his goal. That's why Bible prophecy teaches us in the book of Revelation and you can read about it during the uh, tribulation period, and you can read about it uh, predicted in the book of Daniel. This, a delusion is coming upon planet Earth with such an intensity that even the elect, they're going to be vulnerable to, to this great deception.
this great delusion and they will actually be so spiritually deceived through the apostasy that they will falsely believe that Lucifer or Satan is God and they will worship him as God. Now, that, that's, going to, that's going to anger God because God is God. So when, when Satan sets up himself up at, in the throne room of God and sits upon the throne and demands that he's worshipped as God, then all these prophecies in Daniel and so on about the son of perdition, that's Satan, sitting in the most holy place, that's Satan sitting in the throne room of God, that is going to release God's judgment and wrath. To put it bluntly, all hell will break loose, loose on Satan, the followers of Satan, and planet Earth as God judges the earth because of their rebellion against him and he releases his wrath upon the earth. We're moving towards that with lightning speed. So the key is how does how do believers in Christ like you and me protect our minds, protect our hearts, protect our beliefs, protect our children and grandchildren, protect our nation, protect the people we love. How do we protect them from being swallowed up by this great deception, by, by uh, this great delusion? Many things will happen and we're seeing the initial play out of those things now. Um, first of all, the New World Order that the Bible speaks of and the first trial run of the New World Order began in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was a type of the Antichrist. God judged the world's first New World Order and he promises to judge uh, the second New World Order which is Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots or whores. So, we are seeing things happen in our nation, the United States right now, and the world, which to people who are, are renewing their mind with the Word of God, to people who are developing a biblical worldview, to people who are studying biblically true books, even if they may be on not, not commonly referred to as spiritual subjects. The true biblical Christian should first renew their mind with the Word of God, develop a strong biblical worldview, and be led by the Spirit of God, and then that Christian is putting themselves in a position to be equipped by God to enter the higher realms of spiritual warfare. That Christian that Christian's devotion to God and willingness to prepare is allowing God to use that person in supernatural and extraordinary ways.